Lovely thing I've got about the football, all to football, and the dedication of, and what I put into the game. Yes, you only get into it, out the game what you put into it, Shelley. Mm -hmm. And I put everything into it I could and still do for the people and for the people that I was playing for and the people that I was manager for. I didn't cheat them out of anything. That my idea was that to build Liverpool into a bastion of invincibility, you know, like Napoleon had that idea, he would conquer the bloody world, you know. And that's what I wanted, that Liverpool would be untouchable. My idea was to build Liverpool up and up and up until eventually there would be, everybody would have to submit, give in. Anfield, a monument to a legend. When Bill Shankly vowed to take on the world at football, this was the battlefield he chose. These were the terraces on which he recruited his Red Army. Together they won famous victories in the name of Liverpool. Together they created football heroes. St John. It's Hunt on the board. It's thankfully getting his leg and it's Liverpool on the attack and Thompson has got a good chance here. Oh, he hit the bar. Tommy Smith to Highway. And he's over Hurst's tackle. Man in the middle and he scored. What a goal. Steve Highway. Toshak. Lawler. Yes. Callaghan now. Cormac going in, the chance now for Boersman, and that's it! For Hughes. Yes! So Keegan running over it, Lindsay's chip, Toshak, and it's there! Toshak did that well. Cormac. Keegan. Lloyd's header, and he's got it! Keegan comes in, number one! Bill Shankly built two great teams of champions in his 15 years at Liverpool. He was himself a people's champion. His legacy to the club went far beyond his contributions to Liverpool's trophy collection. He gave them plenty to shout about at home and abroad. But he also gave the club a personality. His personality, passionate, quick-witted, self-confident. He believed in me far more than I believed in myself, you know. And he made me a better player because I thought, if he believes in me, and he wouldn't say it if he didn't, you know, he wouldn't con you, if he thinks I'm that good. He told me after three games, he says, you're going to play for England within the next year and a half. And, and I had. And I, I knew I would. Because I, I knew if he said it, he'd got to be right, you know. So... He, everything I achieved in football was down to him. We, we had a young player, uh, only 17 year old, and he had potential, a lot of potential, but he was very weedy, you know, little thin boy. So Shanks decided we've got to fatten him up a bit, you know, give him some strength and, and really build him up. So they had a, a meeting between the staff and they decided that they would get him to eat steaks, because Shanks was a great steak believer, you know, we ate steaks for 10 years at Liverpool, because Joe Louis ate steaks, seemingly. And Shanks loved Joe Louis, a great thing from his boxing days. So, so Shanks had a contact with a butcher. And every week, the kid had to go down the abattoir, get a big parcel of meat, all these fillet steaks. And he was eating steaks every day, eating steaks and taking them home to his mother and she was cooking steaks. So about six months later, the kid knocked on Shanks' door and, come in, son, you know. Ah, you're looking better now, John, you know. Filling out, son, you know. Steak's doing you good, you know. So the kid went, yeah, he said, boss, uh, I'm getting married. Shanks went, 
you're getting married. He said, well, I have to get married. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, my girlfriend's pregnant. So she asked him, Bob, Ruben, Joe, come in. We've created a monster. <laughs> Bill's unique view of life was shaped in Scotland, where he grew up in an Ayrshire mining family. All five Shankly boys played football professionally. The youngest, Bill, spent the first two years of his working life as a miner. I mean, I was brought up in the mining district, and it was either the pits or football. Mm -hmm. And I think football was a little bit better than the pits. Carlisle United gave him his break in football. Preston North End gave him his education in football. With them, he won promotion, won the FA Cup, and won a place in the Scotland team too. Being a player at Preston, who were well organised, I picked up a lot. And most of the stuff that I've used at the clubs I've gone to was picked up at Preston North End. The way to play, the way to train. We train at Preston, they train to play football. Some grounds, that, some places they train to be marathon runners. Others to weightlifters. Preston North End trained to be football players. And we trained to be football players. Bill was a quick learner. He was soon in management, locked on course for his date with Liverpool's destiny in 1959. And yet it could have happened sooner. In 1951, Liverpool sent for me and they offered me the job. And the only snag was that the manager didn't pick the team. So I went and got the train at the stays and went home. And then nine years later they came down to Huddersfield and offered me the job. So I was really the first manager that picked the team at Liverpool. I didn't come in 51 because I couldn't. I said, what am I manager of? He might well have asked when he did eventually take charge. Early results were poor. There was much to do. I came, I don't know if you've ever seen Anfield when I came. But it was the biggest toilet in Liverpool. <laughs> uh, no, I had to bring the water in from Oakfield Road. It cost £3,000. There was no water to flush the toilets. So uh, that was two things I did. When Bill came in 19, December 59, um, we'd been in the second division. We went down in 1954 and uh, we, we had a, a good assortment of players, but the, 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 the right spirit wasn't there. And when, as I say, when Bill did come, he, he, he started searching out for better players and he, he transferred some from the club, brought new ones in. And then um, we went from strength to strength. When he first came here, Everton were the, the, one of the big teams on Merseyside. But within two or three months, there was only two teams on Merseyside. That was our first team and our reserve team. Shanks got rid of 24 Liverpool players. Of the team he inherited, Ronnie Moran was one of only four survivors through the two years it took to win the second division. Ron Yates and Ian St John arrived to start a revolution. Well, Ronnie Yates uh, uh, was one of the cornerstones here at Liverpool. Uh, his coming, along with Ian St John, around the same time, was the, the very beginning of Liverpool's rise. And they did more for the rise than anybody else. Yeats at the back, St John at the front. Well, the first impression was uh, of a man who has very dynamic character. You know, he does <coughs> the coat, a black coat open, which he always had. The coat was always open and the hands would be in the inside pockets, you know, his trouser pockets. And, and he was restless and all, you know. And he was pacing up and down and, and telling me all about this wonderful Liverpool team, of which I knew nothing about. Didn't even know what league they were in. I knew they weren't in the first division, but... He finally told me that on the second. And, you know, he just made you feel important because he was saying, you know, you come with me, son, you know, you come to Liverpool and it'll, you know, be great for you. And, and he really convinced me to do that. There was always a story about your signing, you know, and I'd, I'd be put on the list at Dundee United for transfer because I asked for a £2 rise, actually. And they put me on the list. And, of course, uh, I played for the British Army team. And the colonel, I don't know, uh, he didn't, uh, our, our chairman, T.V. Williams, here, you know, had uh, a little bit of, he was a friend of his, and he'd phoned him, and, of course, Liverpool were looking for a centre-half, and uh, our colonel had said, well, we've got one playing for us now, a young lad from Dundee United, he's on the list. And the next minute, of course, I get a telegram, and uh, I was stationed at all the shot to go up to uh, Edinburgh. There was a team wanting to sign me, didn't say which one. So off it goes, and I, and I always remember it was the uh, the station hotel in Edinburgh, and I goes in the foyer, and I could see our manager, Dundee United manager, and his director, and I looked over, and of course I didn't know, and it was Bill Shankly, the Liverpool directors. And I thought to myself, do, do I go over and speak to him, or do I go over and speak to my own manager? But knowing Shanks now, I didn't have to. He come marching out of the crowd, you know, and he, looking up at me, and he said, 
What the hell? He said, uh, big lad. He says, you must be about seven foot tall. I said, no, I'm six foot three. He says, that's near enough seven foot for me, son. You know, so I, I thought, I, I was taken aback, you know, and I thought, how do I, and I asked the worst question I ever said to Shanks, you know, and I said, whereabouts Liverpool? It was like a red rag to a bull, and he came right up to my face, you know, and he went, what do you mean, where's Liverpool? And I said, well, well where about? I meant where about in the country? And he went, we're in the first division in England. And I said to him, I thought you were in the second division. He says, we are at the moment. He says, but when we sign you, he says, we'll be in the first division next year. Now, how could you fail to sign for anybody? You know, he had so much faith in me, he hadn't seen me kick a ball yet. If only he'd known. Ron Yates was stepping out onto a thrill ride. The Anfield party was only just beginning. Second division champions in 62, they would win the league title and the FA Cup inside three years. They were the best years of Liverpool's life. The former Ayrshire miner had tapped into a rich seam of local flair and energy. Lawrence Lawler Byrne, Milne Yates Stevenson, Callaghan Hunt, St John, Strong, Thompson. The cop was their 12th man. It was a champion formula. The last frontier was crossed at Wembley. EI Adio, we will win the cup. The soccer war of the Rosie, Leeds versus Liverpool. The two teams making the traditional Wembley entrance. Leeds were on the left, immaculate in white. Hit for the league championship on goal average, the Yorkshire Stars were out to win the greatest of all English sporting trophies, the FA Cup. And so were Liverpool. In control was referee Bill Clements, one of the best in the game. Liverpool kicked off. Liverpool attacked. Collins dispossessed Hunter and then barged into Burn. It was a foul, earning Collins a reprimand. It wasn't known at the time, but Burns' collarbone was injured. For Liverpool, it was a free kick. And here in slow motion, we see how Leeds got out of danger. When Leeds took up the running, right back Paul Reaney was prominent. And it could have been dangerous to Liverpool if goalkeeper Lawrence hadn't been on the alert. So they had to play extra time after all. 22 very tired players on a heavy pitch. And now it was all Liverpool. First blood of the match went to Roger Hunt. Inspired by a goal at last, Liverpool tried again, this time without success. But now Leeds hit back. Right half Billy Bremner equalised. The game seemed back where it started. The second period of extra time. And how everybody at Wembley hoped and prayed for a goal. Ian Sinjin had a good try, but not quite good enough. Liverpool were lasting better than their opponents. St. John made no mistake this time. So the Marathon Cup final was all over and Liverpool were the winners. And what a happy man was Ron Yates leading his team up to the Royal Box. This is the triumph every footballer dreams of. That was Ronnie Yeats picking up the cup for the first time ever that Liverpool had won after 73 years. 73 years? And that's the hardest cup in the world to win. It's a one-off job. Never mind the European Cup. That's virtually new. Winning the FA Cup's the hardest cup. It took 73 years for the... And I thought it was a terrible disgrace that would have suffered the tons of people saying you haven't won the cup yet. Mm. Now that was the greatest moment of my life, winning the cup. Not for me, but for the people in Liverpool. And now the cup was theirs to take home and make the Mersey beat beat as it's never done before. The Shankly signings had paid off. When a player like Peter Thompson put his name on the Anfield register, 
he was signing a guarantee of success. The cup-winning team cost less than £150,000. They won the championship again the following year. They were Bill's pride and joy. He believed in them completely. There was no arguing with him. His team had come up with everything he'd promised. I've always got to have a cup at Liverpool. That's the whole essence. No cup, the place, is, the place doesn't look too good. I think that the team in the mid-60s is at its best. We had 12 players. Jeff Strong was the 12th one who was in and out. I think they were the best team that's been in this country since the war. I don't, I'm not, I don't think so. I'm certain of it. Not because it was Liverpool. But they, they were unbeatable. By divine sense of timing, Bill Shankly had given the city of Liverpool an unbeatable football team for an unbeatable era. Britain's number one port was number one in everything else. The Beatles were the tip of a volcano of talent erupting by the River Mersey. The backstreet ball players of Liverpool were under the spell of a kindred spirit. Uh, I'm Scottish and uh, and the uh, Scottish people have got, you know, humour and spirit and all and, and I think the people are similar in Liverpool. You know, they're spirited, you know, they've got life and they've got humour and I'm the same as them. They were made for each other. They're that kind of people. They're, they're you know, they're arrogant, they're cocky, they're proud, everything and that's what I wanted the team to be. When you a storm Hold your hand up high Out there in the terraces they had people who wanted football and who would die to see them playing and they not to cheat them uh, that's frightened some players I said I don't want you to cheat this is because if you do I'll put you in front of the crowd <clears throat> Since I come here to Liverpool and to Anfield, I have drummed it into our players time and again that they are privileged to play for you. And if they didn't believe me, they believe me now. Star players like Ian St. John were early converts to the Anfield faith. Supporters, they mean everything to me. When I come out on the field on a Saturday, I'm prepared to, to die for these people. Oh, when the crowd start chanting your name, you know, you, you feel ten feet tall, you, you want to do everything. Well, the cop's exclusive. The, the Spine Cup at Liverpool is an institution. And if you're a member of the COP, you feel as if you're a member of a big society uh, where you've got thousands of friends all around about you. And they, 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 they're united and loyal. You, you seem to sense the atmosphere of the COP when you go in it. It's, it is electrified. You feel as though you're an integral part of the team. The people who I know who, who support Liverpool, they are the range from company directors to people who work in the market. Sometimes I can make myself go to sleep at the night thinking of the roar of the cup and just fancying myself thundering down the wing with me stomach hanging over my shorts, you know, and scoring that old vital goal. I, I, said, I don't know if you know the, the, the score, I said, but Liverpool's never lost a game at Anfield in their life. <laughs> I said, no, it's a terrible place to play, I said. I said, even uh, there's, a, there's an invisible man, I said, in the goal mouth heading balls, I said, you can't even see them. <laughs> I mean, but that, the, in Anfield, there's a, at the back of the cop end, there's no, it's no, not a funny joke. There's a, a casket of a man, the ashes. It's in the net, Anfield. And I think that people are overawed when they come to Anfield. Yeah. You know, the saying, this is Anfield. And I said to Malcolm McDonald, said to Joe Harvey, he said, we've come to the right ground, Joe. I said, listen, son, you'll soon find out. And that day we beat them 5-0. Right. And I, candidly, my own opinion was that they were scared to death. The time had come for Bill's team to leave their Anfield stronghold and set about scaring the rest of Europe to death. Their first big obstacle in the European Cup, Anderlecht, champions of Belgium. They had been at Wembley and drawn with England, but really and truly they outclassed England. And I said to Joe Messer coming out of Wembley, I said, how the hell do you play with these, hey, Joe? And this was Anderlecht, of course. So I went over and seen them playing against Standard Liège one Sunday morning, one Sunday afternoon. And I thought, well, we have a terrible match in my hands. 
Time for Shanks to employ his terrible cunning. Whatever he'd seen at Wembley, Bill told press and players that Anderlecht would be rubbish. And when Liverpool beat them 4-0, he told them that Anderlecht were brilliant. But his newest pronouncement was that Liverpool would play better in an all-red kit. I was a guinea pig. And of course, you know, I, with the frame I've got, you know, he wanted me to try it on. Uh, he said, I think we'll look a bigger team. You know, we had a big, big team anyway, you know, and I tried it on. He went, Jesus Christ, he says, you look enormous, he said. <laughs> He even had me going out the main door, you know, no, nobody, in the, nobody in the stadium at all. I had all the red kit on the boots and everything. He went, just walk out the door. And he says, no, stand on the pitch. So he's standing on the pitch and I had to walk out the door and he went, that's it. He says, we've got it. He says, you look twice as big as you really are. <laughs> red was Liverpool's lucky colour. They won their quarter-final with Cologne on the toss of a red disc. It's a terrible moment because it came down. It was leaning over to the red. He picked it up and tossed it again. However, it came down and it was red again, so we'd won. Because the, the number three, he, he was crying like a baby, so I gave him a hanky. <laughs> Sebi finalists at the first attempt into Milan were next in Anfield. I think that's the greatest night that's ever been. Because the cup come out, they had never won before. And there we met, technically, the soundest team in possibly the world. And we beat them 3-1 and had a goal that's allowed, it might have been 4-1. But whatever the score, it might not have been enough. Liverpool were still European novices, Inter were not. The second game... It was a, a war. I've never seen such uh, hostility. Smoke bombs, they were kind of purple, and uh, they were, oh, it was a, an awful feeling. And of course, the, the decisions on the pitch were queer. Yeah. First goal was an indirect free kick, which Corsa chipped into the net and they gave goal for it. Tommy Lawrence was going to bounce the ball, and as he bounced it, the fella kicked it into the net. I don't think that the Inter Milan players were cheats or anything. It was the decisions. And whilst there's a possibility that even if the decisions eh, had been gone in our favour, Inter Milan might have beaten us. Of all the people that I've uh, seen and uh, met, that's the that's one man that uh, he, he haunts me to this day. The lessons learnt, a year later, Liverpool did reach a European final. Borussia Dortmund kicked off in the second half against Liverpool at Hamden Park in the final of the European Cup Winners' Cup. The goal this first half disappointed even Liverpool supporters, but their heroes had come out on the resumption in the attacking spirit. A centre by Thompson earned the corner. No joy for the Merseysiders this time. Now came a breakaway by the Germans. Their centre forward, Siegfried Helt, shot and Lawrence was beaten. That stung Liverpool into retaliation. Tilkowski just saved. Liverpool sent it blood. A brilliant run by Thompson. Thompson centred to Roger Hunt. Goal! <laughs> Extra time now, second period. The score still 1-1. Liverpool looked good enough to win, but appearances were deceptive. Lawrence ran out to get the ball away. Unfortunately, not far enough. Libuda lofted the shot and it was in the net. A freak goal. Liverpool's wonderful chances slip through their fingers. To Germany goes the European Cup Winners' Cup. Liverpool's first ascent to the European summit had been a letdown, but they were getting an education that would stand them in good stead. Back in the Champions Cup, the next lesson came from Ajax in foggy Amsterdam. And it's a goal. They scored. Two and a half minutes. Oh, a good run by Schwartz. And they scored. There's the second one. Well, after 16 minutes, Ajax 2, Liverpool 0. An absolute pandemonium rages throughout this tremendous stadium. 
Krauss tries again. And the referee gives it, what, a foot outside the penalty area? gets it away, Yates covering up. And another free kick for Ajax after the tackle by Yates. Little Muller, the tiny midfield man, quietly getting through a lot of work, going to take this one. It was very foggy, and uh, <clears throat> there was a well-known referee in a Holland. Uh, he was, it was uh, the leading referee, a World Cup man, and he was in charge of all the uh, refereeing. And, uh, the, the, you, you could only see about 40 yards uh, to start with, and then less after that. But he said that to, to the referee, in Holland, if you can see uh, to the halfway line, you play. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the referee said that, uh, I'm not sure what his nationality was, I think it was Italian. Uh, you, you've got to see the whole length of the field before they play. But uh, this referee was a, a, a well-known man in the refereeing associations. So he, uh, he, he said play, and, he, and of course we had to play. And you couldn't see the game at all, Clive. I was on the pitch. The referee never saw me. Oh, not we, were, we were down to nothing, you see. And, and Jeff Strong and Willie Stevens are trying to retrieve the game, and there's another game to take place at Anfield. So I went onto the field to tell them. Uh, and the referee never even saw me. And the, and the press were reporting the match in, in full detail, and I couldn't see the game sitting in the touchline. <laughs> and uh, this is true, oh yeah. But uh, <coughs> Ajax were promising to be a great team. And Groif. Cruyff, or how would they pronounce that, I don't know. Cruyff was a great player, he was 18 year old then. And possibly Cruyff, the debate of if the rubber was the better player. Than Cruyff. Now we're into injury time. Strong just failing to get up to that one. And they scored, have they? I think they've got a goal. I honestly couldn't tell you who it was. I asked them, was uh, unknown. They had a young lad playing for them, for them called Johan Cruyff, who I think Shank called Cruft. Um, but that game in Ajax, it was played in the fog, and we were beaten 5 1. Absolutely incredible. We never believed anything like that could happen. But Shanks came back, and Shanks had everybody believing. He said, There's. You know, we're going to beat these. He said, With the help of the crowd and everything, he says, We'll beat these. We'll overhaul that. Uh, the 5 1 defeat. He says, and we'll go through. And being as a cop right then, being as a Liverpool lean, you just, you believed that was just going to happen. You didn't think any, any other thing about it. And it brought the people in the droves to Anfield on the night. Gates thankfully getting his leg, and it's Liverpool on the attack, and Thompson has got a good chance here. Oh, he hit the bar. Stevenson to take the kick. Lawless up there. A wonderful chance for Jeff Strong, completely on his own, but he headed the ball the wrong way. Oh, a bad one. Tommy Smith gets it out to Thompson. Bad luck from Strong, a nice header just under the bar, but Ball's able to push it over. Now Thompson. That ball, this has been one of Liverpool's failings tonight, putting the ball too square and too often back. 
his time. It's given a break to Ajax. And that's it. Ajax are one up. St. John. Lanky sliding left winger. And it's another one for Ajax. Another complete breakaway. Oh, that's 2 1 for Ajax. They've done it again once more. The centre forward, Krauth. And Liverpool want a goal a minute if they're to stay in the European Champions Cup because they're 7 2 down on aggregate. One of them, surely. Yes, Hunter's got it. Only four down, so that makes it 2-2. Two -two. Shankly's 60s team would never conquer Europe, but graduates of the old school, like Tommy Smith and Chris Lawler, would. A new team built on sound local foundations and revolving round the evergreen Ian Callaghan. Callaghan, a real player. A man, he, uh, he's been there since I went to Liverpool and I've never had to say anything to him at all do this, do that, you don't do this, you don't do that, I don't to say a wrong word to the boy. All I've had to do was to simmer him down in training and stop him from killing himself during the week and shoo him out to, with the curb him. But to say anything to him, you didn't do this, so you did that wrong, uh, a model player, a model man, a fantastic man to have in your books. Callaghan will attempt to put it into execution. And very nearly succeeded. Keegan does! Callaghan's clever little chip across. Keegan's jump. And that's number three. Oh, well, Callaghan's been a bit... That this is the answer to the fact that some of the other boys who are out may ask why they're out. I say to them, well, Ian Callaghan's not out. Why? Because they're con a consistent performer who has played well every match. That's why he isn't out. And he would need to play an awful lot of matches before he was out. Bad matches, I mean. He thought he'd found it. Hughes to Callaghan, who lets go. Callaghan was the one player to survive the entire Shanky era. But partway through, in 1970, the great man was planning major changes. The time had come to enlist new men. Bill Shanky was the greatest man that I ever met. I mean, he was a superb fella, and you followed him blindly, whatever he said. Now... Not everything he said was always correct, but you followed him blindly because he believed in everything he said. And my recollections of, of signing, it was uh, February 27th, 1967. You'd never forget anything when Shanks is concerned. And he came up to Blackpool to sign me. And apparently he'd been trying to sign me for about nine months. And he eventually got me for £65,000, which at the time was quite a big fee. And... He, he pulled me into the, to the dressing room at Blackpool and he got me on one side, you know, and I was overawed, a little bit frightened of the man. And he said, son, he says, do you want to sign for a football club? <laughs> you know, and I actually thought I was at a football club at the time. And I said, uh, well, I would, I would love to sign for you, Mr Shankly. Ah, he said, bloody good thinking, son, bloody good thinking. <laughs> I mean, I remember Emlyn Hughes, eh? I saw him playing his first game for Blackpool, incidentally. It was at Blackburn at the end of the season. And he had, it was his first outing at left back. And somebody said he was about 18. And uh, I said, good God. Uh. So I tried to sign him after the match. That was after he'd played one game. I offered him a, a, a fee for him. And it took me two years before I got him. Hughes. Highway, inevitably Marsh standing off him. Pull back for Keegan. Hughes calling for him. Callaghan! The revival plan was taking shape. 1970, enter Ray Clements. Ray Clements, who's the best goalkeeper in the world. There isn't any doubt about that. Summerby, again one of those well flighted crosses. What a superb save by Clements from Lee. If I decide during the week he'd break your legs if you didn't get up his bloody road. 
He really has all everything. He's quick. He doesn't want to be beaten. He's just a great goalkeeper. And he nearly broke Alec Lindsay's lead one day with a flying tackle. He could have broke his own leg as well. I said, I'm, I'm not taking you out for the sake of Alec Lindsay or anybody else. I'm taking you out for your own sake. You may break your own legs. But uh, he, he toned down a bit. But uh, that wasn't bad. I mean, that was good. I'm looking for players that will fight when there's nothing at stake. So that's what we're talking about, natural enthusiasm. He's a naturally strong boy, and he got no flesh on him at all, no fat. And he, he was keen, and he, uh, he was he's left-footed, of course, but not left-handed. Only when he was playing, it was like uh, the Incredible Hulk. You know, he changed. Uh, when he was playing, he was a killer, but off the field, is a very, very likeable fella. Bell, and they caught those back four square this time. Lee... Clements, what a goalkeeper this man is. At 18,000 pounds, maybe the greatest Shankly signing of all. Next, Bill broke the club record when he invested over 100,000 in a tower of a forward called Toshak. It was to be the start of a beautiful relationship. Keegan letting a run on for Toshak. It's in and it's allowed. The highway. That's a good ball for Keegan's head and Toshak. The supply line for the new firing squad was to be provided by the most qualified of wingers, university graduate Steve Highway. Yeats now to Highway, and the buzz begins again. Highway using his stride. The minute of chip is in. Hughes surging forward to look for Highway, nodded in nicely there towards Toshak. Highway again, challenged by Simpson. Fair acceleration, Highway's got to the far side. Oh, and how did that one go in? Highway doesn't know it's there, but he's found it now. Yes! Oh, yes, it's, it's deceptive. Yeah. But, of course, fastness and cleverness come together. He's so clever with the ball that that makes him look fast. Yeah. What about, he's, he seems to me a very strong player. He takes knocks. Once or twice he was brought down and he mm. seems to show no effect of being kicked at all, you know, from behind. He just gets on with the game. Is he particularly tough? Well, he's got Celtic blood in his veins. Put it that way. <laughs> Bill Shankly, mentor, motivator, approved himself manager, marketeer. He'd built a brand new team, a team fit for Wembley. Graham right back to uh, hook it away for the Arsenal. Hughes to pounce on it. Evans... And Hall, there he is in his midfield position straight away. And still Hall going on. Toshak. Really worrying moments these for the Arsenal. Hall almost getting a chance to turn it in. And it's not away yet. Graham taking far too long to get it away. Heart searching moments there for the Arsenal. And now they are away with Kennedy. A good pass by Charlie George. And Kennedy's shot going across that Liverpool goal. Lindsay. And now Highway. Oh, and my goodness, Toshak was on the far side there. McNabb behind him. And Toshak just couldn't get a foot to it. Or it could have been very dangerous indeed for the Arsenal. And McClintock winning that one well in the air. George Graham, a nice little touch off there for Charlie George. And he let that one go! He really does strike those balls beautifully. And there's Callaghan playing it off for Lindsay, left-footed. Oh, I say it now, can Lawler turn it back? Good way, good work by Wilson. But it's Radford to take it. To summon up an effort for a long one. George Graham will try and flick it on. My goodness, he almost got it there. And flicked away, finally, with the skipper doing a skipper's job for number four, Tommy Smith. And now the corner. in terrible trouble until Larry Lloyd finally gets it away from Graham's header. And now Thompson to Hughes, pounding away. Highway over on the far side, covered by McClintock. Highway versus McClintock, and Highway turning it back, and Wilson there, off the foot of Bob McNair. Lloyd winning it again. Hughes to Thompson, and away on the left is Highway. Still highway, dangerous indeed, oh no, oh that's the goal, Steve Highway for Liverpool. So Steve Highway.
Highway, unknown at the start of this season, has put Liverpool ahead in the cup final. A deep and a curling one, and Clements lost it for a moment and got it bravely at the second goal. Kennedy. George and Kennedy again. Bradford. Back over his head. Kelly is right in there, playing much more as a striker in this extra time. And it's there! George Graham! It's George Graham who got the touch and makes it 1-1! Graham. Bradford. Charlie George. Bradford. Oh, Charlie George, you can hit him. Oh, a great goal! Charlie George! Oh, what a fabulous goal by George! Clements had no chance with that. In the Wembley crowd that day, the last addition to the next Shankly generation. From now, Kevin Keegan would set the standards. So 20 minutes of this game gone without a goal, but a bit more life and promise in it lately as Keegan comes in. Number one. Made that look a lot easier than it was. And then uh, Peter Doherty. They had been watching this for, on behalf of another club for nine months because he, he lived in Nottingham and the Scunthorpe's quite close. And this club he, he was putting him, running him down a short, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't sign him. So when he came to me, I, I uh, didn't hesitate at all. And then when I heard the, for, uh, that Preston had made their offer, uh, we had to go in. How much? £35,000. Preston, I think, we had that offer 25 I couldn't tell you. But they made an offer. He'd done the initial training. The Tuesday before it would be the practice match. Played in the big team. Because an offer was a havoc. And that was the end of it. So on the Thursday I said to him, you like to play in the team? Oh, I said, oh, yeah. I said, I said okay, you play. And he opened up against Nottingham Forest. He won the game. He scored a goal, made a goal. It was a bit of a fluke the one he scored, but he scored it nevertheless. And uh, he, that was something, he never was out of the team until he's reached the stage he's reached now. And then sweeping past McDowell, brilliantly there, Keegan, a superb goal, a superb goal for Liverpool. Well, it's always difficult to go into the, th the, the third and fourth divisions and pick players uh, with any degree of certainty that they're going to be uh, first division players. But in Keegan, we saw a man who had the one thing that we wanted, uh, apart from his ability, his natural enthusiasm. And this is the thing that's missing from everybody, natural enthusiasm. Half the world's short of natural enthusiasm. But Kevin Keegan isn't. And that, plus his ability, of course, makes him uh, a player. Callaghan. Smith. Keegan going in. Keegan, signed for just £35,000, was to be the finishing article in the next Shankly title outfit. The collection went on show in season 72-73. Well cut out, though. by Cormac, who's dropped back well. Kevin Keegan on the right. Koshak goes over to the middle. Highway racing into the middle, too. Keegan... And here's Evelyn Hughes picking up the loose one. Oh, and Hughes has got it! And, and Evelyn Hughes special, which Parks looked as if he had covered. The rebound off the post, and Liverpool go into the lead. Highway under pressure. He's got Hughes just square of him. Hughes is Lloyd here. Lawler, the right back, is free. Kevin Keegan asking for one over the far side. This is Cormac, though. Up against Kingdom first. Pass him easily. Munro getting it half away. And then Hughes can't quite get the bounce, but almost a brilliant recovery. Now Bailey with a man free on his right. Tremendous space here now for Richards. Oh, and a brilliant shot. Covered 
by goalkeeper Clements. Well, it's really wide open up front. Kevin Keegan chasing this one. Oh, doing so well. Great balance. High weight. Free kick to Liverpool, Steve Highway. Kevin Keegan on the near post, Toshek behind him. Keegan. Oh, beautifully taken. What a good free kick. And beautifully taken by Kevin Keegan. Smith, back header by Burzma, Keegan, Lindsay, plenty of men forward for Liverpool, five of them in the box, Hughes now coming out to take some space for himself, crowd getting impatient but everybody's marked tight, Liverpool may play square to try and pull somebody out, Callaghan's found a space and it's a great shot! Smith to Lawler. Burzma. Smith looking for Keegan's head and down for Hughes. So unlucky. Emlyn, who usually blasts them, aimed to place it. Keegan. Hughes was there, but he couldn't really control it. Lawler. Keegan's header against the back of Burzma. Hughes getting in. Lindsay. They're all queuing up to head. That was Lawler. And he's there again. And he almost made it. And if it hadn't been Gordon Banks in that goal, he would have done. Green off running in from the edge of the box. Come to Hurst. Green off. Liverpool all in a tangle, but the goal stands. Fedjik. Lawler's header, intercepted by Skeels. Hughes for Bursma. He's over Smith's tackle and gets the ball out to Highway. Two men waiting for this cross. Cormac! Oh, did Bursma put it over? And Stroke not hesitating to make use of Banks. That may well have been outside the box. Banks has been using the full extent of his area and that time he overdid it. No, from where it's given it must have been more than four steps. The linesman certainly didn't put his flag up and he usually checks on whether the keeper carries the ball outside the box so it must have been for more than four steps. And Dobing saw that coming but the referee was not satisfied that everyone was ten yards off the ball. He wasn't ready, so the kick will be taken once again. It's indirect. For Hughes. Yes! Highway's run made the space for him to go left. Keegan is onside. Free kick outside the area. Keegan.
Egan so nearly squirmed through there. But this now is about two or three yards further back than the position from which Liverpool scored their goal. The same men here, and it's for Smith this time, and it was nearly deflected, first one, and he's missed again! Hurst holding the ball while support comes forward. Green off, Marsh, and now Highway is clear. Nobody in the middle, he's got to keep going. And that was Robertson to the rescue. But the whistle had gone for a foul beforehand. Free kick to Liverpool. This must be the last chance. 40 seconds of injury time already played. Hughes to Callaghan, who lets go. directed headers from both sides and here's Keegan as Webb misses his kick gives it to Toshak and Toshak puts it in Lawler good break by Lawler pass intercepted by Webb and here's Hausman Lucky to get that rebound off Webb. Toshak. Keegan! Well, that repays the compliment. Keegan allowed to trot around unchallenged. Now Callaghan. Header by Harris with two Liverpool men there waiting. Smith, Lindsay. Smith taking it away from him and getting it out to Lindsay. And on out to Highway. Toshak's head again. with them now Highway bursting on it Highway jinking round with space for a shot and the goal yes indeed and Highway the scorer and now it's Lawler Keegan letting it run but uh, Cormac didn't read it but he might still be in there with a chance and it goes off Knowles in the end giving Liverpool the corner with just under five minutes to go to half time <laughs> Lawl has gone in there Toshak and Highway are also there but it's played short this time for Callaghan flicked across there first time oh and keep with a wonderful goal that completely caught Spurs out Callaghan, Keegan coming round, and Toshak's head, goalkeeper didn't know which one to watch, Boyd, Toshak, did that well, Cormac, Keegan, So well, Cormac, the back header from Keegan, and the finishing touch from Tosha. That brings him now on to 14 goals this season. Liverpool lead by two goals to nil, and the game yet not a quarter old. Bill Shankly said last night that playing against Liverpool this season is like being chased by a tank.
and Coventry must know now what he means. Sounds like a happy Christmas on the cop. Keegan. Callaghan to Thompson. Back again. Tremendous shot, and the goalkeeper only got it at the second attempt. Callaghan from 35 yards. Lawler out to highway. Catlin had committed himself in the previous tackle, so now it's up to Bobby Parker. Highway still going on. Now Cormac. Keegan. Cheeky back heel again. Lovely cross from Lindsay. Cormac might well have done better to steady that, but it's given to them. Off the line by Barry, robbing Toshek of his hat trick. How did that first half hour compare with how you've been playing this season? Would you say it was one of your best displays? Definitely. As, as well as we've played, we played football, we played it quick. Uh, one of the goals had a slight element of luck about it, but the second one was a cute one. Uh, when you play well, uh, you may get goals that don't look good goals, but you, you get them because you're playing well. And then they started to knock the ball around with so much confidence as though they really just knew there was going to be a man there. Well, when you're playing well, things break for you. And this now was, what, the 37th game for most of them, and yet no sign of tiredness? Yes, I played 37 matches, and uh, I think it's asking too much from a human being to do that. To train and play and be excited and everything. What sort of instructions have you given them about Christmas? Oh, not to eat too much Christmas pudding. And uh, to behave as uh, well as they can. Because we've got a stiff programme ahead of us. Another 30 games lay the other side of Christmas for a team chasing four trophies. They had a five-point lead at halfway in the title race, though. And it was to be more than enough. Larry Lloyd to Phil Thompson. Highway, taking it well on his body. And then sweeping past McDowell. Brilliantly there. Keegan, a superb goal. A superb goal for Liverpool. And the little man has done it again, Kevin Keegan. Cormac with this throw in for Liverpool. Keegan, shaking off Nish. Toshak! Cormac again. Richards, good challenge, and Lloyd gets it though. Oh, he should have let that one go. He's given the free kick to Liverpool. It was a clumsy uh, tackle by Richards. Could have given the advantage. Toshak across the box, and Keegan! It's 1-1! One -one. Good header by Keegan. Paul. Borsma, oh he did that well! Liverpool stayed the pace and stayed to the party at their final home game against Leicester. The Copites were hanging up their decorations in anticipation of the point needed for Shankly's third league championship. Lancing header by Keegan was good. Highways cross, dangerous! Thompson to Keegan! Great save by Shilton, but out for a corner by Whitman. That was absolutely point blank by Kevin Keegan. And Shilton showed his England class then. Highway. Keegan's header. It was Weller who got to it. Keegan again. Sending men the wrong way all over the place here. Lloyd deflected. And again Shilton gets his body in the way. Callaghan's cross. Borsmer inside to Highway, come to Callaghan, Hughes, good ball to Thompson, and back again to Hughes, this could be it, no it's not, Stringfellow, and there's the whistle, and Liverpool are champions, and out comes the trophy, which is awarded to the league champions already bearing the red colours of Liverpool and now the 
salute for the champions and for Bill Shankly who takes off his jacket to reveal the characteristic red shirt. This is the man they love. The cop rise and Shankly responds. A great day for him. And a great, great day for them. And here go the champions to accept the homage of their supporters and to pay their respects to the crowd who carried them along. And now listen to the roar as they approach the cop. And this great communion between players and supporters, all one now, on a great day in the foot history of Liverpool football. That's where the heart of Liverpool football beats. Somewhere in the middle of that lot is Bill Shankly. There he is, waving to the crowd. Admires who most there. What a moment for him. Been through it before, but it'll still excite him just as much as it did the first time. Last Saturday was the greatest of all of them. Winning it early on was a novelty. The last Saturday, because it was a new team, and they had worked so hard for so long and got pipped last season, and pipped the season before in the cup final. It had gone again for the third time. It was far more satisfaction and definitely the greatest moment I had in, in football when we won it. I think it was the 72-73 season when we'd won the league. Uh, a policeman down at the cop end, you know, he, he, nothing can be said to him. There was that many scarves coming on. But I can remember him just kicking it away and pushing it into the dirt a little bit. And Shanks come over and pushed him away. He said, hey, he said, that's somebody's life. He says, don't be kicking that. People pay good money for that. He said, that's people's lifeblood. Give me it here. And he picked it up and he put it round his neck. And that was the way he was, the affection that he had for people. Eleven days later, Shankly's people were counting on a double. Anfield stays the first leg of the UEFA Cup final with Munch and Glad back. But Rain stopped play and stopped Borussia too. Brian Hall played. He didn't play Big John. He played the, sw the small men. A terrible torrential rain and the ground was flooded. He took the players off half an hour after the game started. And I said, thank God for that, you see. So I said to John Toshak, you go home, John, and get to bed, I said. And you get ready for tomorrow night. And uh, because the, the defence was, wasn't was very good in the air and, and stayed in the box. So we just, uh, John come on the next night and we pumped the high balls into the box and flicked them on and in no time at all, it's 3 nothing, and the game's all over. In the first leg, at the second attempt, Liverpool had pulled off a 3-0 win. Shankly had pulled off the perfect robbery. But his boys still had to smuggle the silverware out of Germany, and that wouldn't be easy. Wimmer. And again, Callaghan in there, but now Rupp. Is this the chance for Rupp? Heinkes! Yes, 1-0! The scorer, Joseph Heinkes. Kulik to vote. Played again towards Rupp. Now, can he get past Lloyd? Well, he's got past Lloyd and Smith. Heinkes. Oh, and there's a goal. Heinkes. A beautiful curling goal. And Liverpool are in trouble. Just before it started, a thunderstorm came down and wet it. And it was gone like lightning. We're down to nothing in no time. And I thought, Chris, we're going to beat 10 nothing. Yeah, that Wimmer and Danner and Netzer and this little centre forward were ripping us to part, apart. But they're in themselves out. And just before half time, you could see the steam had gone out of them. And whilst we were tired, because we'd played more games than them, they were more tired. And at the end of the day, I said at half time, I said, we might even get a draw in this match. And we, the, the score finished 2 nothing, which we'd won in a total aggregate of 3-2. And I would say that the, the, the UEFA Cup, it could be as difficult to win as the Euro European Cup. Because the, the teams that are in it are the teams that are promising to be great teams. 
It was great because uh, we had we had beaten uh, a team uh, which had five players in it that I thought were great players, very good players. And the <coughs> the when we come back home on the plane, we arrived at about one o'clock in the morning, and the airport was full of people. That was the greatest thing of all. You know, that was something really worth, worthwhile. I mean, that was worth all the hard work and worry that had been gone into it. To see these people in the air, in the uh, speak aerodrome at uh, one or two o'clock in the morning, thousands of them. Yeah, it was really brilliant. Yeah. Back home, it was business as usual, and as usual, the team to beat were Leeds United, the creation of Bill's great rival, Don Revy. Well, I think the matches with Leeds United really were uh, the highlights. They were always uh, difficult and tense, and and the uh, you know always uh, amazingly clean. Callahan. Now he's got Bursma out there on his left. Cormac is going through the middle. Highway is wide out on the right. Bursma has lost it to Maidley and it's gone on to Jones and now Bates. Clark is going through into the middle. So is Jones. Bremner on the overlap. Bates tries one. It was a very good shot from Bates and an equally good save by Clements. Lorimer given instructions by Giles. Good header by Clark. And Jones has got it with the overhead. Bursma with the corner. Thinking twice about it. Lloyd's header, and he's got it! Highway to Keegan. Lindsay. Chase for Charlton. And he slipped as Bursma comes in. And Bursma must keep going. He can score here. He's got it! Hughes. Flicked on by Keegan, who's again, and Liverpool beginning to exert some pressure. Callaghan, nodded in by Toshak, Lawler is there, Gray will clear for Leeds. Highway, Clark back, and giving it to Highway, who keeps it in. Keegan! Eddie Gray to take the second Leeds corner. Lorimer number seven going out to assist him. It changes his mind when Callaghan pursues him. And it's in. It's into the roof of the net. Clements came for the punch. And it looks as though it's Mick Jones who is receiving the congratulations from his teammates. But whether he actually touched it or not, I really couldn't say. Bates on to Gray. And he's over Lawler's tackle. And he's got room to steady himself for the centre. Clark coming to meet it. Stepping over it for Lorimer. And Lloyd's tackle. But Lorimer goes on and scores. Well, Liverpool didn't do that very well. Lorimer not wanting the free kick to be taken quickly after he committed the foul. Callaghan through. Lawler. And here's Toshak. During Shanky's 15-year Anfield reign, Liverpool won seven trophies and Leeds won seven. It was a rare old rivalry. Near a home, local rivalry took on an almost religious fervour. Harry Catrick's Everton just had to be beaten. Tommy Smith really wriggling to get himself out of trouble there. And Whittle! Yes, he's got it! Morrissey... And a good return pass, he's onside. Royal unmarked at the back, here he comes. Good goal! And Tommy Smith to Highway. And he's over Hurst's tackle. Man in the middle, 
And he scored! What a goal! Steve Highway! He used to take the throw. And Highway's off again. And a useful cross. football. This is Lindsay. And here's Lawler coming round. Goal! Victory over Everton, the greatest bounty of all. But amidst the commotion of the great Anfield occasions, Bill was preparing a lasting present for Liverpool fans. Bob Paisley, his wily apprentice, had learnt his trade well. A whole dynasty, a house of Shankly, was waiting in line. Like Paisley, Joe Fagan was acquiring Shankly wisdom. I'll tell you who makes players. Do you not know? The mothers and fathers. <laughs> not coaches. It's not coaches that make players. It's the mothers and fathers. I try and explain to people now that all the time Shanks was in, he never practiced a corner, free kick, uh, anything. He just didn't practice anything. He played five a side, five a side, got fit and played five a side, five a side. Never, never practiced a free kick penalty. Anything, any corners, any set pieces, they never practice, and nobody believes me. And yet there was a careful method in each moment of Shankly madness. Everything had its purpose. My fourth game for Liverpool, or fifth game, was against West Ham United at Anfield. I'd scored in my debut after 30 minutes, bobbled one in off my shin. I'd got uh, another couple of goals, and suddenly people were talking about me, you know, and I think he felt that maybe I was feeling a bit of pressure of that. And... Uh, we're playing West Ham and it's Bobby Moore, it's Jeff Hurst, it's Martin Peters, it's the World Cup winning team. It, you know, tremendous respect. And uh, he used to wait at the door, or just down the passage, and he always watched the other team come in. Always. It was a ritual. And he'd say, hello boys, how are you, and all that, you know. But he was watching every move, looking for the ones who were limping, you know. And he came into me and he sat down he said, uh, Hey son, he said, I've just seen that Bobby Moore. What a wreck. He said, uh, he's got big bags under his eyes, uh, he's limping, he's got dandruff, and he's been out to a nightclub again, son. Because uh, just before that, they had this incident in the Blackpool at the nightclub, you know, the whole West Ham team. And suddenly, you know, from maybe feeling a bit of pressure, I was playing against this uh, old geezer who's got dandruff, who'd been out all night and was limping. And of course, uh, went out and played. And we beat them 4-1. They played fantastic. Bobby Moore was brilliant. And I happened to get a goal against him. But, I mean, he, he probably that day was one of, one of the best performances I've ever seen of anyone I played against. So he came in and he said to me, Hey, son, he said, he's some player, that Bobby Moore, isn't he? He said, you'll never play against anyone better than him. He's probably the greatest motivator um, ever there was. My own personal one, I was about 18. I'd only just come into the team. Um, played about six games and Shanks left me out here for a game against Arsenal uh, the lads ended up getting beat 2-0 I think Alan Ball and John Radford scored the goals beating here at Anfield so Monday morning I come and running around said have you been to see Shanks and I said oh no no frightened he says go and see him he said he'll think more of you if you go and see the man so I went off knocked on his door and he come in son you know I was terrified I uh, sit down uh, he says what do you want and I said, well, uh, boss, I'd like to ask why I wasn't playing Saturday. He said, Jesus Christ, son. He said, you're asking me why you weren't playing. He said, you should be in here on your bended knees thanking me for not playing you. He said, them, he said, them, that team out there, I said, are rubbish, they're useless. He said, they're finished. He said, you have got a, a great chance in life. He said, you're going to be some player. You're going to play for Liverpool regular, captain the club in your country he said you son are going to go a long way in the game he said you should be thanking me nothing else that is all i said and i thought oh god i walked down to i walked down to that room and i felt 10 foot tall the only problem was he didn't play the following week <laughs> in his prime at his peak with football hanging on his every word bill shankley was preparing his final word 
1974 Cup final was his farewell performance. Keegan up ahead of him, and there's Howard's header. Howard again. And now Keegan. Good piece of reaction play there by Highway. And he's got past Howard this time. Here comes the cross. And Toshak is going in there. But Paul didn't know where it was. Here's Lindsay, though, for Liverpool. Keegan in a little bit of space. Still with Keegan. A little flick there for Hall. Now Hall can get this over. Right across the face of that Newcastle goal. Smith for Newcastle stopped there with a good challenge by Alec Lindsay. Now this could be a devastating break for Liverpool. Lindsay going on. Keegan trying a dummy. Lindsay again! Oh, what a goal! Alec Lindsay! No, it's disallowed! Disallowed! It will not stand. Linesman on the far side is flagging. Lindsay must have been offside. It stays nil-nil. Liverpool get a throw. And Newcastle at the moment looking just a little disorganised. Here's Hall. And now a chance for Keegan. And that's it. Kevin Keegan has scored for Liverpool. That one stands and Clements is happy. But Paul just got his hand to it. But he couldn't stop it. And that is the breakthrough. Kevin Keegan, top scorer. Now just a quarter of an hour to go. Liverpool won the scorer, Kevin Keegan. Newcastle nil. The back header there by Toshak now for Highway. Number two, Steve Highway. That's the one, I think. Shankly being hugged by the others on the bench. Highway being mobbed. But Paul has to pick it out of the net for the second time. There's Toshek lurking away on the right. It looks pretty safe for Liverpool now. The confidence is really oozing out of them now. Spraying it around. Nice, simple passes, but always accurate. So comforting to know you've got a couple of goals in the bank with just a couple of minutes left. Kevin Keegan trying his tricks, and there's the floating cross again. Tommy Smith almost arrogantly putting it there for Brian Hall. Back again for Tommy Smith. Turned inside for Highway. Playing it again for Smith. What a good move. Oh, and yes, it's there by Keegan. His second goal. And what a move that led to it. So Liverpool, who narrowly failed in the league championship, win the FA Cup. Kevin Keegan, two of the goals. The other one from Steve Highway. A great day for Merseyside. And what a smile. The smile, the clenched fist of victory. He looks so pleased. Emlyn Hughes and Liverpool. I think the G is a few prouder than I've ever done before. Never has a sporting figure become such a father figure to his public. He could have had anything he wanted in Liverpool, and yet Bill Shankly had had enough. It is with great regret that I, as chairman of Liverpool Football Club, have to inform you that Mr Shankly has intimated that he wishes to retire from active participation in league football. And the board has, with extreme reluctance, accepted his decision. I would like at this stage to place on record the board's great appreciation of Mr. Shankly's magnificent achievements over the period of his managership. Meanwhile, Mr. Shankly has agreed to give every assistance to the club for as long as necessary. How do you feel what's about the news then? today? What, what's the news? news? The Shankly. Shankly's retired. Oh, yeah. What? <laughs> He's How do you feel about it? Yeah. It's news. It's news. Kidding you, know? He's not, I'm not kidding you. Shankly has actually retired today. He wants a rest. He's leaving. He's leaving. Really, He's not a supporter of the retire. He's a retire as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm deadly serious. Is he is he He's, he wants a rest. He's getting out of the game. Yeah, I know, yeah. Is he sick? He must be <laughs> he sick. Is. He's, He's not sick. No, he says he, he says he gets very tired. The pressures are great. He wants a rest. 
Well, this is not oh, in the paper. No paper. No, no, is it? Because well, now it's 12 o'clock. On the wireless. On the wireless at 12 o'clock. I've just been at a press conference where he announces we was finishing. Is, is that true? It's true. I, that I swear it's the truth. Honestly, I'm not joking. Really. Ah, you know? on. When did he retire? Today. He retired. He's finished today. Mm. Oh, it's terrible then. I don't know what I'm going to do. Bill Shank is retired. Is he? He's finished. It's a bit of a shock for me. How do you feel? It's terrible. Do so you have me on, aren't you? No, I'm not having one. I've just been, been to Anfield. Honest. Who said? He said, he just announced it at the lunchtime today and the board were with him. Oh, Bill Shankly. Bill Shankly is retired. Yeah. What, did, what did Shankly mean to you? Everything. Everything. And, and, and how difficult a decision was it to make? Oh, uh, the most difficult decision ever I made to, to leave, uh, to decide to leave the club, eventually, I mean. Uh, possibly it was like going to the electric chair, that's the way I had, the feeling I had. The King had abdicated at the height of his rule. Liverpool said its fond farewells to the head of its royal family. Uh, I must say, um, it's not very good fair to my wife. I don't go out to, to pictures or theatres. Uh, I think we've only been out twice in Liverpool, my wife and I. What, since you arrived? Yes. Uh, I don't think we've been to any... We've never been to any clubs. Uh, we've been to the theatre once. And the... Uh, we went to some... Uh, Fate, garden fate during a summer. Some but husbands wouldn't think they could get away with taking the wives out twice in such a long time, Bill. How do you Twice do in 14 years. Yeah, I think it must be a record. But uh, my wife, my wife realises that. She's a sensible woman. And she knows, she knows that uh, Liverpool's a city that's, uh, we say, football crazy. Well, everything I've got, I've got a football, to football. And the dedication uh, and the, what I put into the game. Yes, you right. only get into it, out, out the game what you put into it, Shelley. Mm -hmm. And I put everything into it I could and still do for the people and for the people that I was playing for and the people that I was manager for. I didn't cheat them out of anything. So I put all my heart and soul to the extent that my family suffered. Do you yeah. regret that at all? Oh, yeah, I regret, oh, I regret it very much. Yeah. Somebody said the football's a matter of life and death to you. I said, listen, it's more important than that. Um, if there wasn't football um, at Liverpool, he would go to Everton. Wasn't at Everton, he'd go to Manchester. Wasn't at Manchester, he'd go to Newcastle. There was nothing on at all. He'd go to park and watch two kids kick a ball around. Uh, if there was no games on, he'd organise one. <laughs> it was one of them fellas. National acclaim followed Bill Shankly, OBE, into his new life. There were countless invitations to keep him from retirement. But the very idea of him turning his back on the game he loved and still played was unthinkable. Tie up jealous when you get the coffee. And you put the lid down. Your name's in the top. I hope it's a long time before Can't they start thinking about it. It's the stupidest word I've ever heard in all my life. There you are. Nobody can retire. I mean, what's happened in, in, in Russia? Chow has died. 78. The man who took his place is 71. And the Chinese only start when they're 70. And the people, when they, when they get the certain age here, oh, they should retire. What a word. Eh? Oh, stricken from the record retirement. Objective. Haven't retired, no. Retired from Anfield, yeah. From football and from life, no. On the 29th of September 1981, he finally retired from life. They think I was the best manager in the game and I should have won more. <laughs> yeah. Well, what? Why, why, why I didn't, didn't do go anything? On? I didn't do anything in devious, with devious ways. I mean, I, I would <laughs> fight you and I would break, your, break my waist <clears> leg if I played against her. But it wouldn't cheat us. Fear was a word he didn't know. Respect, yes. But not fear. Didn't exist in his vocabulary. But but you can't make decisions at this game. You can't make decisions in life. You're a bloody menace. You, you're, better, you're better to go and be an MP then. If I could sum him up, I would call him Mr Liverpool and leave it at that. Because, um, you know, I don't think you can change the name of the club at this stage when it came to Shankly United. Oh, yes. I dreamt of everything that was great. And there was only one aim, that was to bring the European Cup and all the Cups to Liverpool. What he did in the early days, which was winning trophies, is continuing today. Few things have changed in the way of players and everything, but the basics are still there. From what he laid down, the foundations, is everything to do with this football club. We're professionals, and we're simplicity. I won't come onto the, the television and speak or write about anything and say words this length that only half the people listening understand. 
this in this in our language there's words that are similarity. They can you know they are spelt differently but they mean the same thing. And there's words that mean the same thing. But the big men use these words, knowing full well that maybe ten percent of the viewers will un only understand what it means. Well we don't. We speak the language that everybody understands. Instead of me saying somebody was avaricious, I would say it was bloody greedy. <laughs>